questions. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about a new project that Carol alluded to, um, and uh, I'm, I'm doing this uh, with Keith and, and also on behalf of Steve Dubinet, who is our um, uh, our co-PI on this and, and many others, and, and I'll introduce you to them as we go through the talk. Um, so Keith, at any point, feel free to interrupt and interject. Um, we've sort of, we worked on this together. Um, so um, we're gonna be talking about a project called Stop COVID-19. It's Share, Trust, Organize, and Partner, the COVID-19 California Alliance. Um, and it is an outgrowth of, of many different entities. Um, and we'll describe them in a little bit. And I, I want to start off by talking a little bit about um, the reason that this came to be. And many of you um, will not are familiar with uh, slides like this um, that shows rates of COVID-19 hospitalizations and deaths among um, patients by race, ethnicity. And as you can see, Blacks, uh, Latinos and Asians have higher rates of, of COVID-related hospitalizations and higher mortality from COVID. Um, uh, relevant to um, RICMAR is this slide, which shows cases among of coronavirus um, in different by race ethnicity. And not surprisingly, we see that African Americans and Latinos have much higher rates of the disease. And there are so many reasons for this, many of them structural. Um, that uh, we can't go into them all here, but I think it's something that um, really motivated a lot of discussion and a lot of calls to arms um, by, uh, by investigators, by community members, um, and by the NIH. Um, now, you are all familiar by now in the tabloids with Operation Warp Speed. Um, this is a really important initiative to develop and implement a safe and effective vaccine for COVID-19 and to do it as quickly and safely as possible. And what they've done is they've mobilized existing clinical trial infrastructure, generally the HIV vaccine trial study sites, um, along with several other sites as well as private sites, um, to um, really rapidly roll out a vaccine for COVID-19. Um, importantly, there was no um, effort made or no plan to skip any steps. So the phases of the clinical trial all overlapped instead of running separately. Right now, there are about 49 different vaccines in various states of development, and there are nine COVID-19 phase three vaccine clinical trials um, uh, active, uh, either actively in the field or on pause and about to relaunch <laughs> in some cases. Um, and I think one of the reasons that we are here is because of the, the lack of representation traditionally in clinical trials. This is definitely not a new thing. Um, while Blacks make up 13% of the US population historically, they've made up about 5% of clinical trial participants, Latinos at 17% of the US population, but only 1% of clinical trial participants. And I think it's this other figure is also important because it shows that there's real heterogeneity in who gets enrolled based on the type of trial. So um, you see NIH funded trials and then industry funded trials and you have much lower rates of participation of minority um, uh, individuals in the industry funded trials. And that's something that, that we are grappling with right now as a part of this project. Um, uh, COVID-19 is no different, um, and you know this is uh, a New England Journal article that highlights the um, minority enrollment in a phase phase one um, uh, component of the vaccine trial development. They had 45 participants overall. 40 were white, two were black, six um, identified as Latinx, one Asian American. Um, or um, one Asian American, one Alaska Native or American um, Indian. And, you know, so you see that this is a very relatively small numbers given the prevalence in the population. Um, so this, as, as well as some early results from the Moderna trial, which was the first one to roll out, indicating that there were very few minority participants, um, particularly African-Americans, but combined African-Americans and Latinos made up a very small proportion of um, the enrollees, despite being the high, at highest risk for um, getting COVID-19 getting COVID and, and dying from it. Um, 
So that obviously is a, a, a really important reason for addressing this issue. There are lots of reasons though for why we need a diversity in COVID-19 clinical trials. Um, and I think you know the, the lack of a national level coordination has really hampered our ab ability to create harmonized evidence-based recommendations that, uh, that collectively touch on the many diverse communities that are disproportionately affected by COVID. Um, there's also widespread misinformation at all levels, but that's layered on top of deeply rooted mistrust in many communities, um, particularly the African-American community. And as the vaccine trials are proceeding, we're sort of watching um, this very perilous slide in terms of the proportion of people who express vaccine hesitancy, saying, I, I don't really think, I, I'm not sure I wanna take this vaccine once it, even once it's approved. So that went from 25% in June of this year to 35% in August and 50% in October. Um, and uh, so that really highlights the need for well-informed national messages to, really, to engage high-risk individuals. Um, and I think another really important factor is that when a vaccine is identified, knowing that you had, um, uh, that a large proportion of the people who participated in the trial looked like you can make a big difference for some people's willingness to accept the vaccine. Um, and certainly if you think that, you know, a very, very small number of African-Americans or Latinos or Asians or um, uh, native um, Hawaiians or Pacific Islanders participated or American Indians, and you may be less likely or less willing to participate. So it's sort of in this context that the NIH and particularly NHLBI and um, NIMHD formed the Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities or SEAL. And it has several uh, key objectives. Um, first is to conduct urgent community engaged research and outreach that's focused on COVID-19 awareness and education. And it's specifically to address the misinformation you know, and try to make sure that we're promoting an evidence-based response to the disease. The second aim was to promote and facilitate inclusion of um, diverse racial and ethnic populations in the COVID-19 trials, um, which were at that point a moving train. So that they, that they were, they had most of them, several of them had already started uh, and or were near completion. Um, 11 of these were awarded um, uh, and the states are listed here and, and California got one. Um, it was a pretty rapid turnaround. And I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about the fact that it was also, uh, it was very rapidly rolled out. And you know the goal was to really support community engagement and community partnered work. But I want you to, this is a slide that we developed and I think the numbers are pretty accurate. So if you look at R&D and manufacturing, that 6.5 billion that has been um, funneled into this effort. Um, when you look at, um, you know, BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, that's another 3.5 billion. Um, community engagement, 11 million um, spread across 11 community partner networks. So that's 11 states. So it's a pretty, um, in some ways this is dispiriting, um, but I think it's also important for us to acknowledge um, that the, the amount of, um, I think, resources put into these efforts is nowhere near what's needed. Um, and it's also um, late in the game. That said, it's important that it's being done because historically very little attention has been paid to this. Yep. Um, I'm gonna sort of briefly um, just give you an overview of the way the SEAL network works. It's, there's the SEAL Alliance, the 11 sites are meeting regularly. They have an executive committee, um, an inclusive participation in clinical trials working group, a communications working group, and a community needs assessment and evaluation group. Um, I'm gonna drill down now to what we're doing here in California. The Stop COVID California network um, includes 11, um, academic health centers that have extensive community partnered networks. Um, and uh, we felt it was important to try to be representative of the population centers in the state, um, it, particularly because we have a very large state at 39 million. The COVID cases as of um, a few, about a week or two ago, we had over 880,000 cases and over 17,000 deaths. Um, so we have included in our network um, all the CTSAs in California, 
um, because they have um, this large cohort of, um, they all have community partner networks and community engagement programs. Um, and then RCMIs, and there are three RCMIs included, Charles Drew University, which is part of the UCLA CTSI, um, San Diego State, and um, UC Riverside. And then we also included UC Merced, which is a, um, an RCMI eligible institution, um, but also in an area that's very hard hit. Um, this is our, our team of the site, all, all of our co-investigators. And so there are about 23 or four of them. Um, and then we have 70, just over 70 active community partners across the state. And that's really the critical component here. These are the groups that are gonna make the difference um, in this effort. And um, we had, I, I sort of glossed over this, but we had about two weeks to put in this application and it was amazing how quickly people came <clears throat> Table and how willing they were to offer advice and counsel and um, support the effort. And, and I think it speaks to the nature of the community partners that have been built across um, the state, the community partnerships. Um, and and we're, we're hoping that this can be leveraged for other entities, for other conditions and other problems. Um, so these are our overarching goals. We want to partner with community stakeholders to identify unique barriers and facilitators to knowledge about COVID, um, thinking about feasibility and acceptability of the trials, and then once the vaccine is approved, uptake of the vaccine across these high-risk communities. We also think it's important for all of those three efforts to co-develop and examine the effectiveness of culturally and linguistically tailored strategies, and then to identify best practices for training and deploying these academic community partner teams. And we really feel it's important not just to think about this as pushing things out from our academic centers, but really taking information in and thinking about how we, how we use the information um, and the expertise of the community partners. So um, the, the projects are just, some of them are just launching. Actually, some of them have been ongoing and they sort of fall into these categories. Um, education and outreach by trusted partners, community health workers, local media, um, uh, visual artists, um, qualitative research that uh, conducting focus groups or deliberative community engagement in, um, in high-risk neighborhoods and multi-ethnic neighborhoods, capacity building, training the, the trainers, you know, the community health workers who are going to go out into the field, um, making sure media understand what, um, where the, what reality is, where the falsehoods are, um, and then disseminate the information that people really need. And we're gonna be doing some surveys um, and various types of studios. We're trying to reach a number of different populations, including um, uh, Latinos, African-Americans, um, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, South Asians, um, essential workers, immigrant communities, LGBTQ individuals, and those who speak our monolingual Spanish. But we're also looking at um, among farm workers, for example, in Merced. Um, so we're also trying to, so each site is gonna be doing individual activities. And then we're gonna be doing some statewide programs. One is in working with the California Health Interview Survey, um, which as you all know, is conducted in a number of different languages across the state annually. And we're, they, they fielded a COVID-19 survey. They're gonna be working with us to develop a dashboard for each of our partners, um, but also um, really thinking about adding important questions and relevant questions for our communities to the 2021 survey. So we'll be working with them on that. And then they're going to do some. They're going to do some work around discrimination in Asian, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities who have experienced a huge amount of discrimination related to COVID over the past year, um, past six months. Um, and then uh, another joint effort is ethnic media outreach, outreach with some training. Um, and th so those are kind of the big efforts. Um, I and we're we're working with um, each of these. Uh, uh, clinical trial groups across the state to make sure that the vaccine trialists are actually conducting outreach in a way that's both ethical and, and allows them to reach the right people. Um, one other thing I wanted to make sure to talk about are opportunities for partnership. Um, you know, I, I didn't go into detail into the projects and we'll be providing lists on our new website. But 
we have a number of UCLA projects that would be very interested in partnering with, in, with academics as well as community um, groups and uh, organizations. Um, there is a statewide, the statewide consortium as a whole is gonna be looking to partner with, with groups as well. We're also working with um, various efforts in LA County and the outreach and engagement, much of it is being led by Erica Flores Uribe and she is, um, she actually alerted us, and many of you may have seen this, to an, uh, an opportunity for our community partners. Um, it's led by the Community Partners Foundation, and it's the County COVID-19 Community Equity Fund. Um, their, their grants uh, between about 100,000 and 500,000. Um, they are due on October 30th, um, and, uh, but they do have technical assistance. Um, they know it's a rapid turnaround and rapid review, but they, they encourage people to um, pursue them. Um, and then finally, we're working with the California Health and Human Services Agency um, to really think about state, the statewide efforts around COVID, um, messaging to individuals, to patients, to doctors. And so we'll be um, kind of circling back uh, to them to learn more about what they're doing. They want to learn more about what we're doing, and hopefully we'll be sounding boards for each other. Um, I want to thank you for your time, for inviting me to come to the RICMAR meeting. It's been a little while since I've been to one, um, and uh, it, but it's always a pleasure. And I, I look for hopefully next year I can come back and talk a little bit more about what we've learned. Um, I also wanted to highlight our websites and actually other resources that are available online. Yeah, and, and Arlene, I just want to thank you for an amazing job in leading this. I, I don't think people really understand the magnitude. There was a from when it was announced, there was originally a 10 day turnaround. It ended up being 14, but it was 10 day turnaround, which we were, were ready to respond to in which, during which time we had to pull together a proposal with all of these state partners and each of their, and each of their community partners and our community partners into one cohesive, semi-thoughtful, <laughs> semi-clear <laughs> proposal. <laughs> And, um, and all we were able to Keith was very involved in all of this. So. And, and our lead was our, the fearless leader here and really turned it around. So thank you very much. Amazing job. Thank you, Keith. And, you know, I, I will say we wrote a lot heavily on, on many of our community partners, some of whom are on this um, Zoom meeting and on Carol Mangione's editorial skills. So, <laughs> um, you know, it, it takes a village. And, uh, you know, I think once you finish Rick Mar, you know, you never actually truly leave. So. <laughs> That's important to recognize.